Hello everybody, I wanna talk to you about an imaginary story for a minute, all right? Go with me in your imagination to, to this kind of situation. Jesus wakes up one morning, early in the morning, he opens his eyes and he sees sunlight shining through the small window of the guest bedroom where he'd spent the night. He could hear his friend already in the kitchen preparing breakfast and he had no doubt about it. The mother of all buffets was being prepared because his friend Martha, he was there with Martha and Mary, her sister and their brother Lazarus. His friend Martha always put out a great spread of food and he always loved being in the home of these two sisters and their brother. And for just a little bit, it came to his mind, you know, it sure would be nice if I could take the day off and spend some time with them. But then he thought to himself, you know, but I can't do that. The devil never takes a day off. And besides that, my father's counting on me. So getting up out of his bed, he, Jesus begins to mentally organize his day. And he thinks, what, what can I do for my father today? He said, I know, I'll preach a sermon this afternoon. That's one thing that will cause my father to really be happy with me. So he's washing his face with a wet cloth. And he thinks, you know, there are a lot of sick people in this area. Maybe I'll heal some of them. My father would certainly be pleased with that. Maybe I'll even cast out some demons today. That'll be a big ministry event. When he finished dressing, he thought, you know, maybe if everything goes well, I can find a funeral service and raise somebody from the dead. Yeah, that's what I'll do. My father will be thrilled with me when he sees me take on a ministry project like that. And those things should pretty much fill my day. So he puts his sandals on, and before he walks out of the bedroom to face a new day, he prays and says, Help me, Father, as I try to do my best to live for you today. Use what I do for you to bring glory to yourself. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that scenario? What are your thoughts about that, describing how Jesus might have started a new day? If it sounds pretty good to you, then I implore you to <laughs> pay attention to what I'm saying because I want to be sure you know that the scene I've described is an imaginary scene. Nobody would imagine Jesus living his life in such a way if they understand anything at all about the life of Christ and what it means to live this grace walk. I mean, the very idea of Jesus trying to score brownie points with his father, there's no way. And yet, for a lot of years, I lived my life that way. I got up each morning focusing all the, on all the things that I planned to do for God during the day. I believed that the reason God opened my eyes to him to start with was so that I could serve him. And I sure tried my hardest to do my best. I dedicated my life to trying to live for Christ. I was diligent. I was sincere. And I often felt successful at it. You know, with my Bible in one hand and my to-do list in the other hand, I'd go forward to make my mark for God in what I considered back then to be a heathen world. I think most of you know that I was a local church pastor for over 20 years until I was 40 years old. I was a pastor for 20, almost 21 years. I was very serious about it. My life was dedicated to trying to do my best to serve Jesus Christ. My, my, my behavior wasn't always consistent but my desire was. I wanted to live for him and I tried my best to do the things I thought he wanted me to do. And even if I thought I wasn't doing a good job, I wanted to be good at it. And I believe that everybody should try to do the things they believe God called them to do, that he wanted them to do. And back then I thought it was my job to tell them how to do it. So every week I would preach sermons as a pastor intended to motivate the congregation to try harder by God's help to do the right thing. But, I did notice that no matter how hard I tried, I always had this underlying sense that I failed to accomplish my own internal to-do list that I carried around every day of my life. When I felt like I was successful, it was gratifying, but I wouldn't have called it satisfying because I always felt a need to do more. I kept trying to live up to what I thought God wanted, but I never felt like I had succeeded. 29 years after I had first begun to trust Christ as a little boy, God showed me some things that shocked me. And I talk a lot about that secret today, but I tell you, the thing that he showed me goes against the conventional wisdom of the whole religious world, including the belief of a lot of Christians. 
because it's contrarian. And here it is in a nutshell. This is just one part of the secret. God doesn't want us to try to serve him. Let me say it again. God doesn't want us to try to serve him. God doesn't want or need you to do anything for him. What a blow to human pride that is. I spent much of my lifetime trying to do the things I thought God wanted me to do, but I came to a place where God began to show me that my whole paradigm was wrong. I mean, I had heard and even taught that we're the only hands God has. We're the only feet he has. We're the only eyes, ears, and mouth he has. That's a scary thought. <laughs> he's, in, he's in a precarious position if that's true. God's eternal agenda doesn't hinge on our success. But when we look at modern Christianity, you could conclude that if what I've said is true, that God's, we are the only hands, the only eyes, the only feet, the only mouth, etc. that he has, you could conclude that God must be a paraplegic when you look at the way that the modern church world functions. <laughs> All right, maybe I'm being a little sarcastic, but you get the point. In Acts chapter 17, verse 25, the Bible says, Nor is God served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Acts 17, 25, God doesn't need us. If you believe otherwise, I encourage you to take an honest inventory of all your abilities and assets and then compare them to the omnipotence of a God who stood on the vast edge of nothingness and said, Let there be and there was. Think about it, and after you've thought about it, state one more time what it is you think you have that God needs. If you find it troubling that God doesn't need you, let me give you some good news you'll be glad to hear. The good news is He wants you. He doesn't need us. He wants us. He set His love on us, and He only has the desire to enjoy intimacy with us. He doesn't want us so we can serve Him. Jesus prayed a prayer in John 17, and in that prayer talking to the Father, he said, this is eternal life. What's it mean to, be a, to experience eternal life? What's that mean? Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and the one who you have sent. Jesus said the reason we've been given eternal life is so we can know him and his Father intimately. It's not about doing things for him. Don't get me wrong. I mean, of course we serve. Of course we do. But we're not human doings. We're human beings. And when we begin to understand grace, the doing flows out of the understanding of being. Let me stop right there and be honest. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come clean with you. What I've, taught, what I've shared with you now, I've been reading it. Didn't sound like it, but I was actually reading it from a book I wrote. It's a book I wrote back in... 1998, back then it was called Grace Rules. Grace Rules was the name of it. The book, the publisher owns the book, and the publisher released it again, I want to say it was in 2014, under the title, uh, The Secret of Grace. Stop following the rules and start living. The Secret of Grace is the name of the book. And that's what I've been, I've been sharing this morning, of what I've given you comes out of the, this book, The Secret of Grace. You can get it on Amazon or at Christian bookstores, whatever. But I was sharing out of that because I'm going back to some of the roots that where I started with my teaching all those years ago, 1998. Because you know what I realized? People, people need to hear this message of the simplicity of grace. Religion will put you on the chain gang. It'll, 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 it'll commit you to St. Shawshanks. <laughs> you know what, some of you know what I mean. It'll, it'll put you in St. Shawshanks where you're going to be walled in and you've got Every move you make is dictated. That's what religion will do, but grace sets you free. And the secret of grace, well, let me just say this, and, and, and shameless commercial. I have a private group, a subscription group, where I teach five days a week, and I'm going through this book, The Secret of Grace, over there right now. You can go to gracewalkexperience.com to find out how to subscribe. I'm actually doing 55 teachings out of the book that I just shared the first little part with you, uh, uh, you know, from the book. 55 teachings over there uh, on the secret of grace. Here's the deal. Number one, I, let me say a word to those of you who are believers in Christ. If you think it's hard, you miss the point. It's not hard. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said that, not me. But religion makes it hard. 
So to the extent that you're finding it hard to live out your faith, you're entrenched in religion. Because Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. It's not meant to be hard, and it's not when we understand it. But a lot of people have got messed up in the church world and the world of religion and legalism, and so they don't understand it. I'm, I'm teaching about that. The secret of grace. That's what I say to the believer. If you think it's hard, it's because you've not understood it clearly. Or if, if you think that there's got to be more than what I'm experiencing, well, there is. There is. Or if you are here today, and I've got friends who don't profess to be believers in, in Christ, and they don't call themselves Christians. If you don't call yourself a Christian, let me tell you, don't judge Christianity by what you see <laughs> in the Christian world. God has some horrible advertising going on these days. Don't, don't judge the Christian faith by what you see of a lot of folks that call themselves Christians, but look at Jesus Christ. He's the poster child, so to speak, for the Christian faith. It's not, maybe it's not what you perceived it to be or thought it was. So all I can tell you is I, this, the way I'm talking to you this morning is the way I talk because it's real and it's transformed my life. I used to be real religious. I'm not religious anymore. I'm not big on religion at all. In fact, I'm against it, to be honest with you. But I'm for Jesus Christ, unapologetically a follower of Christ. So anyway, I talk about it five days a week, gracewalkexperience.com. If you want to come on over there and check it out, you can find out how to join us. Otherwise, I'll keep coming back here every week on uh, Facebook, YouTube, and I'll post these teachings to be an encouragement to you. Hey, follow me on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, go over to my public page and follow that way. I put a post on there every day, not videos, but I do put a post on the, there every day. So check it out. All right, enjoy talking with you this morning. This, one, of the, one part of the secret is the secret of not trying. We don't try. Listen to this. We trust. Big difference. I'll talk more about that another time. Have a good week.